Well, good afternoon and welcome to this session of Raising Peace's Anzac Weekend event. The Raising Peace Network is an informal network of people and organisations that celebrate peace and the people who organise and work for it. It also promotes dialogue about peace and its issues and wants to create positive engagement in the ongoing progress process of peace. In the panel discuss discussion that's going to follow my little introduction, we aim to explore alternative approaches to Australia's security narrative. My name is Nick Dean. As well as being involved with Raising Peace, I'm a member of the National Committee of IPAN, the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. And I'm also convener of the Marrickville Peace Group. My role has been to bring our panel together and get this event organized, but I won't be playing an active part in it beyond uh, this little introduction. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, that uh, white Australians like me live on stolen land that has never been ceded. I speak to you on land from which the Gadigal people were violently dispossessed. I honour Australia's First Nations elders and all those who struggled to resolve our violent past in pursuit of a peaceful future. However, the received wisdom in Australia seems to be that we need to be on a more or less permanent war footing, always ready to engage in the violence of war. Why that is and what we should do about it, where our true security lies and what threatens it are all questions that need discussion. And that's what we're encouraging in this afternoon's session. To some extent, the length of the session depends on the interest our speakers generate and on your response, the level of interest you show and the questions you ask. But the intention is that we will finish up at around four o'clock and that should give us sufficient time for everyone who wants to, to have some input. The session will be recorded and stored on the Raising Peace website so you can view it over and over again if you wish. And don't forget that there is another session coming tomorrow afternoon with the title Exploring Ways Forward. Before I introduce today's facilitator, I would like to mention the names of Jasmine and Mansi, who are working behind the scenes on the technical business of conducting this Zoom. So that's all from me. I'd like now to introduce our facilitator for the afternoon, Dr. Keith Souter. Dr. Souter is probably already known to most of you. He's considered to be an influential global futurist and is a well-informed commentator on national and foreign affairs. He's published several books and has been the foreign affairs editor on Channel 7 Sunrise program for many years. So over to you, Dr. Souter. Thank you very much indeed. Nick, it's a pleasure to be with you. I join with others in acknowledging the traditional owners, the land on which we meet. I'm sitting on the uh, land of Cadigal people, part of the Eora Nation, and I pay tribute to their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, the format for today, as Nick has uh, summarized, we will have four presenters and I'll introduce um, all four in a moment. We'll then at about three o'clock uh, have questions and um, we invite you to uh, put your questions into the chat box. Nick will be monitoring those and at three o'clock we will then go to Nick for him to identify some of the questions to put to the four speakers. So that'll go on until about 3.15. And then at about 3.15, you will be allocated out into breakout rooms. Each breakout room will be convened by one of the presenters. So that'll be done by our um, amazing team working behind the scenes, Jasmine and Mansi. They will, they will allocate people. Uh, we invite you to, in your group, um, after you introduce yourselves, to then produce a report of the discussions, et cetera. And then at 3.45, we will bring everybody back into the plenary session for a quarter of an hour of a summary of the discussions. During the discussion groups, we're asking you in particular to address the question, where to now? What are the implications that we've just heard from the previous hour? How should we move forward? So it's gonna be a very action oriented discussion. Okay, so that's the outline for the today, and we hope, as uh, 
Nick has indicated that we'll finish at about four o'clock. It's my pleasure now to introduce our four presenters for this afternoon. They'll be speaking in the following order. Jake Lynch. Now, Jake is a pioneering figure in the field of peace journalism. Associate Professor Lynch shares his knowledge and expertise on the subject in his role at the University of Sydney as an Associate Professor in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies, where he teaches three units of study. Key issues in peace and conflict studies, conflict sensitive development practice and conflict resolving media. His debut novel, an historical mystery thriller, was published in 2009 and he is the patron of BDS Australia. And he will no doubt explain more about the role of BDS. He'll then be followed by Cheryl Durant. Cheryl has over 30 years experience in the national security sector, including specialist army intelligence and defense capability and preparedness role. She has also championed international cross government academic and business collaborations focused on creating a better understanding preparedness for existential risks and exploring the systematic connections between climate change and other security risks. The third speaker is Dennis Doherty. Dennis is a former school teacher with extensive experience in many schools across Australia. He has been an active member of his teachers union and has a keen interest in and knowledge of education. He is a prominent member of the peace movement here in Sydney, organizing and coordinating many marches and rallies for peace. Dennis is well known in his community for his community building work and his advocacy for public housing and social justice. The fourth speaker will be Albert Palazzo. Dr. Palazzo is an adjunct professor in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. Previously, he was a long serving director of war studies in the Australian Army Research Centre. He has published widely on Australian military history, as well as the future character of war. Among his many books are Planning to Not Lose, the Australian Army's New Philosophy of War. His current research focus is on the potential of the strategic defensive um, to serve as a basis of Australia's defence policy. He will explain defensive initiative in his presentation. His next book is forthcoming from the US Army, Army University Press, and is entitled Climate Change and National Security, the Implications for the Military. Four expert speakers covering four diverse areas. We therefore invite our first speaker, and what I'll do, we'll just, if I can just speak to Jasmine and Mansi, just run the speakers through one after the other, I think, without my having to come back to interrupt the narrative. So we invite Jake now to speak. Thank you very much, Jake. I think I've unmuted myself now. Yeah, thank you very much, Keith. And uh, it's good to be with you, everyone. I. Um, I'm also on uh, Gadigal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and um, follow the example of uh, both Nick and Keith in being pleased to acknowledge their uh, elders uh, and their leaders, uh, past, present and emerging. Now, um, as you may imagine, uh, our uh, class in this present semester in key issues in peace and conflict studies has not been short of material uh, for students to get their teeth into. Um, I've been saying to them that um, we as a group have a, a ringside seat, of course, to observe uh, many of these key issues, not only um, in the obvious context of um, the Russian incursion into Ukraine, which um, has been thoughtfully laid on for us to coincide exactly with our schedule, um, but also in Australia's federal election, where I've been suggesting we are witnessing, um, to some extent, a, a, a contest between, or at least a contrast between different concepts of security. So we've been trying to think of how we could define security. And one of the influential uh, figures um, whose work we've studied is the US 
uh, feminist and peace theorist Betty Reardon. Uh, and Betty Reardon explains how she has constructed a concept and definition of security based on paying close attention to the work over many years and in many places of women peace activists. And the formula she arrives at is that security is the shared experience and expectation of well-being. Now, that's a very commodious definition, uh, which is a good thing, because it's capable, therefore, of enabling us to switch topical focus away from war and to a range of other issues, which can nonetheless be conceived of as issues of security. Now, um, I don't want to encroach too far onto the talk that um, Cheryl is going to give us, but um, it's quite clear, isn't it, that being able to sit in our own home uh, and expect that we will be safe there is clearly a security issue. Uh, and that um, expectation of well-being is jeopardized by the increasing severity and frequency of extreme weather events associated with anthropogenic climate change. That's a, a sequence of connections, which is based on um, what I would call an, an overwhelming consensus of credentialed opinion. Uh, and that is in turn based on an incontrovertible mass of uh, data and evidence that human-induced global heating is affecting our security prospects in many places around the world and in many ways. Um, but that is profoundly uh, inconvenient for a clutch of vested interests in Australia. Uh, I'm talking, of course, uh, of Australian capitalism uh, that are um, based on extractivist principles and practices. And um, what that has produced over the years is, is a strong strain in political responses of denialism. So we're familiar with, with climate change denialism. Now, climate change denialism um, is uh, rather rarely put forward these days. There's the odd stray uh, senator from the One Nation Party in the wilder reaches of Queensland who crops up on Q&A now and again uh, and uh, makes a, a thoroughgoing muppet of himself by trying to take issue with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its findings. But generally speaking, climate change denialism has been forced underground in Australia. It is arguably manifest in the um, shadowy diplomatic campaigns that Australia runs, for example, to weaken uh, the final communique of the COP26 Global Environment Summit late last year, or the lobbying Australia does in the shadows to try to prevent UNESCO from pronouncing the Great Barrier Reef to be at risk uh, from the effects of um, uh, marine um, warming, etc. So, so climate change denialism has been beaten back into these redoubts, although it is arguably still with us in these ways. Uh, and indeed, um, in the present uh, federal election campaign, as many will have seen, uh, the Australian Greens have totted up all the uh, prospective new coal and gas projects in Australia, and which they maintain, to which they maintain both. Uh, the parties of government, the coalition and Labour are still committed, and the total they reckon is 114. So we're a very long way from uh, being on the point of, of deciding to leave hydrocarbons in the ground in order to safeguard our security in the face of catastrophic climate change. Now, the reason why um, I put that, um, uh, I characterised the issue in the way I did, is because there is now another issue on which there is a clear consensus of credentialed opinion, uh, and one um, which is backed by a, a colossal bank of incontrovertible and expertly marshaled evidence, which again uh, raises issues of security, uh, and which again is inexpedient to powerful vested interests in Australia, and it is being met with a similar strand of denialism. I'm talking about Israel apartheid denialism, now, um, we've had a clutch of recent reports concluding that Israel's treatment of Palestinians amounts to a violation of the 1973 UN Convention on Apartheid. Uh, and there have been such reports from um, Palestinian and Israeli NGOs and from international monitoring groups, Human Rights Watch, and most recently, of course, and influentially, Amnesty International. 
And just let me read you a little portion, or a couple of little portions from the Amnesty report. The Amnesty's report is distinguished by tracing the system of discrimination back to the establishment of the State of Israel in the 1940s. Ever since then, it says, and I quote, Israel has pursued an explicit policy of establishing and maintaining a Jewish demographic hegemony. And that's from its executive summary. Later on, it elaborates, since its creation, the Israeli state has enforced massive and cruel land seizures to dispossess and exclude Palestinians from their land and homes, thus rendering them a group with perpetual lesser rights. So um, this um, drum beat of reports coming out from groups which encompass the uh, span of credentialed opinion on this subject is unanimous in its finding that Zionism, uh, the effort to maintain a Jewish majority and ascendancy in a portion of historic Palestine, is only supportable by sustaining a crime against humanity, an ongoing crime against humanity that is maintaining a state of apartheid. And that adds to the um, serial violations of international law, uh, which is the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, and international humanitarian law, uh, which are also inextricably implicated in that program of, of domination and suppression. I refer to international humanitarian law, specifically the Fourth Geneva Convention, which says an occupying power must not move any portion of its population into the territory it occupies. And therefore, the present investigation by the International Criminal Court uh, is looking, among other things, at the entire program of Jewish settlement building as a potential war crime. So this, um, again, is a consensus which should be seen as analogous to the consensus on climate change, and it too has been met with denialism, uh, not only here in Australia uh, by politicians of both leading parties, uh, but also, for example, by um, uh, Jen Psaki, the White House spokesperson who is now going off into a, a career in television news. Uh, let's hope she um, has a bit more respect for the facts when she arrives there. Um, and also uh, the leader of the UK Labour Party, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, who as a lawyer um, should frankly have more respect for evidence and due process. Um, but this uh, denialism should be seen as, as analogous to that uh, in regard of, of um, uh, human-induced climate change. So it begs the question, how do we tackle denialism? How do we tackle denialism? Now, um, there's an interesting shift underway, I think, in this federal election, uh, as many will recall, um, those who rued the outcome of the election in 2019 uh, paid particular attention to events in Queensland and just how it came about that the, the electorates of Queensland had seemed to be much keener on sticking with the coalition governments than on voting for change. And one of the factors that a number of people named was the concurrent campaign, not part of the election campaign, but taking place at the same time to stop Adani. So it was a campaign against opening up the um, open cast coal mine proposed by the Indian Adani Corporation uh, because of concerns of how it would add uh, to global heating and therefore to the, the effects we're all familiar with. And um, it is speculated, as many will have seen, that this played a part in frightening communities where extractivist wage packets still underpin local economies into rejecting change and sticking with the existing arrangements. So I think it's interesting now to um, notice that where in the present election people have detected headway being made on this issue, it is rather more likely to be associated not with saying no to something, but with putting forward an alternative in its place. So the party, the, the Green Party campaign, for, for instance, uh, is um, concentrating on approaching coal communities and assuring them of um, a plan uh, that would be put into place to ensure the continuation of jobs in the energy sector as the uh, part of managing the end of the coal industry and the transition to a decarbonized economy. Uh, decarbonization is also a prominent word in the Climate 200 um, group literature, um, which is funding the so-called teal independence, 
uh, trying to um, knock out prominent Liberal Party uh, candidates and MPs, as you will have seen. Um, as regards um, the denialism over Israeli apartheid, uh, I am, as uh, Keith said, uh, the patron of BDS Australia. The three BDS demands are an end to Israel's occupation of 1967 of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the equality of rights for all inhabitants of the present state of Israel, and supporting the right of return for Palestinian refugees. So uh, they are three uh, positive things, and um, it, it's, it's effectively calling for a reversal of the partition of Palestine. But what I want to leave you with is that when uh, people are asked or when people come to share um, dreams and visions of what the future might resemble um, in a, in a post-Zionist uh, world, if you like, in a, in a world where um, uh, Palestinians enjoy their rights, they often uh, express it in terms of um, open borders. So these are the words, for example, of two writers of Palestinian heritage, Janine Hurani and Amal Nasser, in a recent contribution to Overland magazine. They look forward to a future that transcends the colonial construct of borders, where statelessness is no longer a lived reality, where we can drive from 48 Palestine to the West Bank, and the West Bank to Jerusalem without crossing a checkpoint, where we can drive from the Galilee to Beirut to Damascus without crossing a border. Now, I read that and I thought, I hope they envisioned driving an electric car uh, powered by solar energy. Um, but um, it, it leads me to attend to a portion of the globe where the most concerted actions have been taken to obviate borders, borders which are the default setting of our nation state system unless such action is taken, namely the Schengen zone. And the Schengen zone is a free travel zone based on the adoption of the same standards and high level of individual rights across now as many as 26 uh, contiguous territories. Uh, so that is a, a, the basis of a positive vision uh, which could be promoted and promulgated uh, to counter Israel apartheid denialism, just as looking forward to a decarbonized economy and society can be the positive vision to counter climate change denialism. So with those positive visions, we on the progressive side and the peace side uh, can um, uh, tackle denialism and insert hope and expectation of shared well-being in its place. Thank you. Right, I'll, I'll just roll on. So uh, thank you, uh, Jake. I start from a, a slightly different uh, framing of security than Jake, so I'll share my definition up front. I tend to try and unstrip all those adjectives and adverbs from security and take it down, if you like, to its, its basic essence. And the, the definition I find more most useful is security is freedom from harm or fear of harm. And it's that, that fear bit that I'll be returning to in my presentation. I think it's one that often we fail to address by focusing on the, the harm itself. Being a good intelligence analyst, I, I start at the analysis of our operating environment. So, so how are we going now? And I think everyone would have to agree that the, the current state of global security is really very, very parlous. From the climate and environmental side, we have five of nine planetary boundaries breached. And if that's not doing uh, alarm bells, uh, it should be. You know, breaching one planetary boundary might be uh, bad enough, but five of nine are now declared as breached. And many of those indicators of sort of global health or global security or, or goodness on the globe have taken a turn for the, for the worse. So for a period after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there were some positives. Uh, conflict did seem to be decreasing. Democracy did seem to be increasing. Uh, trust did seem to be increasing. But all of those indicators have taken a turn for the worse over the last uh, decade to half decade. So democracy is down. There are very few uh, pure democracies left on planet Earth. Most are now flawed democracies or something worse. Uh, trust in government is sort of all time low uh, in periods where we've measured trust in government and conflicts are once again on the rise, whether internal or uh, 
principally internal, thankfully, but uh, also now external, as we unfortunately see in Europe once again. Uh, after a period where we thought we said this would never happen, but uh, it unfortunately has. And so as a system analyst, I conclude that our system is failing. Our current system of global security uh, is not working and all the other securities aren't really working as well. So food, health, uh, economic, all of these things are quite fragile. And when thinking about how to intervene in a system to sort of uh, put it back on track or, or improve the circumstances, I return to Danella Meadows, the, the great system theorist and one of the originators of the Club of Rome Limits to Growth work. Now, Danella had a system of 12 places to intervene or leverage points, as she called them, in a system in order to make change. And the most powerful one was the paradigm or the framing or the thinking of, of how we view the system. And when I return to that wisdom from Danella, I feel that we're really currently missing a point in our particularly national security community. And that's because we don't have, as, a, as the primary problem, national security problems. What we have is global security problems. Problems like climate change aren't solved in nations, they might be solved by nations, but they have to be solved collaboratively, collaboratively with everyone on the planet and other problems that uh, are really sitting down at the root cause of, of many of the things that are bad today are things like inequality. That's not solved but within nations or by thinking in a national security way. Uh, things like um, environmental degradation, again, pollution, all of these are now global problems. And our current framework of politics, political economy, military security, national security thinking, is, is too siloed really to grip up and lead effective solutions in that space. Now, there are alternatives to national security thinking. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about three of them as potentially better ways to think about security going forward and with the, uh, the objective, I guess, of, of peace, uh, <laughs> equality, a just world and, and stopping the environmental crisis. So the one that most of you are probably familiar with is human security. And this has now been uh, around for quite a while now, a couple of decades. It's a well-established practice, but it also doesn't seem to be necessarily solving those problems. Uh, fortunately, it did have a, a great a reboot earlier this year as, as part of a suite of UN reform with the UNDP's special report on human security in the Anthropocene. And if you haven't read that, read that uh, report, it's, I, I recommend it to you. And what it really did, along with many of the other UN reform initiatives, is sort of expand the voices or expand the groups involved in talking, collaborating and thinking about security to include communities, business, non-government groups, and the other thing I found really important in that report was the adding of agency to the pillars of human security. So to the existing pillars, it said, well, action itself is now a pillar. We can't, can't just have a, a talk fest. We need to look and think perhaps less in terms of rights to receive and more in terms of obligations to do. So instead of a, a national sort of uh, charter of human rights, Perhaps we need a, a national charter of people's obligations or groups' obligations. It's a different way, again, to flip the paradigm. If we're sitting here entitled to something, uh, it might not be the right way of, of mobilising action. The second framing of security, that, and one that I find personally quite attractive, is ecological security. It's been a, a dominant way of thinking about security in China. In fact, the President Xi Jinping was one of the uh, leading thinkers on ecological security. And you, you may also hear the term ecological civilization used and was at the uh, COP in Kunming last year, the, the forgotten COP. The difference between ecological and security and human security is it adds two dimensions to our concept of human security, which is all about putting individual humans first. Because it's about security, not only between humans, but between humans and the environment which I think uh, in the breach of planetary boundaries is an absolutely necessary 
addition to how we think about security. If we're not thinking about the balance between needs of humans and needs of the environment, we're missing critical things. The other thing ecological security has in built in it in uh, many of its uh, thinking is also about intergenerational security. So it's not just about security here and now, it's about security between now and the future. And another element that's sort of embedded with that is the sense that security and justice go, go close in hand. If you don't have a just society, you don't have a secure society. If you don't have an equal society or relatively equal society, you don't have a secure society. So it's bound up in the sense of, I, I sum it up perhaps uh, by going completely outside the box and looking at the principles of permaculture, which I think have uh, three lovely principles. It's uh, human care, land care, fair share, fair share now and, and to the future. The difficulty, of course, is, is getting these concepts uh, in practice, but I think that the real start point is not, not to think in our current way of thinking, but to converge on a way of thinking that really gets to solve the root causes of the problems not the immediate thing of, can I blow up the state next to me? There's also an emerging uh, approach to security, which has been pioneered by an Oxford professor who was uh, formerly a neuroscientist, uh, Nayef al Rodan, and he talks about symbiotic mutualism. Again, something that attracts me um, because it draws from biology, in particular the study of uh, relations, symbiotic relations in biology. And symbiotic relations are the relations between symbionts, the most uh, familiar being uh, fungi, and plants. And plants and fungi exist quite happily in a mutual arrangement where both benefit. And in fact, the worst relationship in a symbiotic relationship, and there are seven variants, is competition. In a symbiotic relationship, competition is negative, negative, that where the positive relationship is mutualism. And again, we're captive in this language of competition. In co language of competition, someone beats someone else. Someone ends up on top. So even the language of competition is, is, is insidiously uh, working against a secure, just, peaceful, equal world. The other theme that comes in is neuroscience. And there's some exciting new developments in that space that uh, I think counter the argument uh, that, or Darwinian thinking, really, that national security thinking is dominated by. And national security thinking really assumes that the powerful will oppress the weak. This is the natural way of things, Darwinian, the, the stronger will uh, defeat the weaker. What neuroscience is now telling us is that's not the innate nature of humanity, nor is it the other that we're naturally good. We're actually naturally what he calls a tabula rasa, a blank slate. We have an innate drive for survival, uh, but we're not inherently... Uh, competitive or inherently peaceful. We, we, we can go either way based on our experiences. And this is where the fear is really important. And I think it's critical to address the escalating environment of fear because neuroscience tells us that fear, or under conditions of fear, humans make really bad decisions. What fear does to our mind at, at the chemical uh, electric, electrical uh, level is it makes us focus on some of our older uh, brain um, wiring, which means we tend to think short term and we tend to think about the immediate threat and we tend to think only about the group close to us and not make connections with, with people far away or, or other, other communities and other countries and other cultures. So the fear itself is a really critical barrier to moving towards a more peaceful uh, future. And I'm just going to leave it there. Um, as I say, there, there are other, uh, I think, alternatives to uh, national security thinking, but those are three that I think are promising. And I'd be interested to, to hear the views of the audience uh, later on. Thank you. If I could have the uh, share screen, the function, please. Um, I was just waiting for uh, the share screen function.
You should have the shared screen function. All right, thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Hi, everyone. And thanks very much to the organisers. And I too acknowledge, I speak from the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. And I speak on the stolen land that was never ceded. The arms trade in Australia is beset by justifying myths and in many cases, ironclad concealment of information about how our media, our military matters and a supine, a supine media that easily accepts whatever is fed to them by the military. In regard to AUKUS, with the acceptance of the fact that the LNP government and the ALP opposition have broadly agreed to Australia having nuclear submarines, the media has, has reacted by totally ignoring any opposition to AUKUS. Some of the justifying myths of Australian militarism could be described as Australia's participation in wars is always honourable. Australia is a benign place for peace activists. Australia's practice of human rights is far superior to any other nation. Dealing with the first one. When Australia, Australians act in war, it somehow becomes virtuous, virtuous and, forgiv and forgivable. Here is an account of the RAAF bombing civilians in Mosul and killing 18 civilians. So when the RAF, RAAF bombs, it has been cleared of wrongdoing and the deaths have been attributed to lack of solid intelligence. Contrast the, this report to the reports of when Russia bombs in Ukraine. It is described as brutal and gut-wrenching. In Afghanistan, we, are, we seem to be getting a blow-by-blow -blow account of what Australians have done in Afghanistan due to the Ben Robert Smith defamation trial. We've had a more clinical report from the Brereton report in which he says, there were 39 cases of violations of human rights by around 19 Australian SAS troops. Looney, when he was looking at another war, put it this way. He, uh, he had a uh, story about a, a very nice prime minister who was forced to go to war. And I'll just read you the final pa panel. The nice prime minister did this only because of bad intelligence advisors who misled and tricked him into it. And the children all respond with the words there, bollocks. Another myth is that Australia is a benign place for peace activists. We can have open discussions, we're free to this, we're free to that. In regard to the media, Australian peace act act activity is largely ignored. Pine Gap and its establishment is still shrouded in, in, in uh, secrecy uh, over 50 years after its establishment. From the start, it was called a space research facility when everyone, when it was well known that it was a CIA spy base. This is a sign that appears one kilometer from the gates of Pine Gap. The gates at Pine Gap are seven kilometers from the actual buildings. So we can see that the base is protected, not against potential enemies, but against the Australian citizens and peace activists. Any trespass here earns you seven years jail. We also know that at the slightest provocation, the government can introduce draconian anti-protest laws, as we have seen recently in New South Wales. 
but the biggest and most successful um, response to the peace movement is that the media just ignores it, just won't report it. And we have a defence department that is completely secretive and non-communicative. It is so bad that even mainstream journalists complain of the lack of information. In my time in the peace movement, I have seen police break arms, ankles, and massive arrests and prosecutions. I've seen, I've seen police organize protests to be minimized. I've seen police with the support of government insist on giving permission for our democracy, which we reject. The government followed up arrests by withdrawing benefits, which was done by an AOP government. You can't have those on the, on the dole exercise their democratic rights. Australia is, sees itself as a great practitioner of human rights. And Australia is seemingly unaware of its own shortcomings. Colin Fats, a significant author on Australian racism, describes the reactions of Australian politicians in the 50s when they had to sign the UN Convention Against Genocide. Australia and Australians wouldn't do anything like that, they said. Why should we sign such, such a convention? The Moore uh, cartoon has another take on, uh, on Australia's human rights record. It doesn't matter what Saudi Arabia does. Recently, they executed 80 men on one day. A few years ago, there was the infamous case of Khashoggi being cut into pieces. A, a journalist who was critical of the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. And there's also the fact that Australia, uh, that, that Saudi Arabia is running a proxy war in Yemen, which has been described as a huge catastrophe. Australia still willingly supplies weapons to Saudi Arabia and to other human rights abusing countries without any sense of guilt or unease. There's an a ACT company called EOS, which is, which is selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. It received a healthy subsidy from the Australian government for doing just that. Here we are outside the offices of EOS in Sydney. Our expenditure on the military does threaten other parts of our budget. This cartoon features the choice between the F-35s and several other items in our budget, pensions, Medicare, environment, and so on. We may have thought that F-35s were expensive, but the cost of the submarines is so much worse and threatens the smooth running of this society. The government's role of increasing fear of enemies, such as China, rushes the people into accepting these overpriced toys for our so-called security. The rush to spend over 2% of GDP on the military is being done with alarm and haste so that people do not have time to assess or balance out what is needed and what, what is over the top. You've seen the price of submarines go from 90 billion up to 170 billion. We have to get the gee whiz factor out of the arms production and see them as producing misery, death and heartache just as the weapons are doing in Ukraine at the moment. When the Ukrainian president asked for Bushmasters from the Australian government, this was reported breathlessly as, they even know about how good our Bushmasters are over there. 
the euphoria was equivalent to winning a gold medal at the, at the Winter Olympics. After all, they're only glorified trucks, but, in, but they are weapons. And instead of providing non-lethal aid, we are providing lethal aid, which will in turn not increase, will not decrease, but increase the violence there. To set about stopping the arms trade is a huge task, far beyond the reach of any one person. However, the best approach to fighting a huge problem is to grab the near edge of it. In our case, we are fortunate, I mean, to some unfortunate, that we have an arms bazaar set to be held in Sydney in a few weeks time on May 10 to, to, to the 12th. You can look up the details of this arms fair by putting in Indo-Pacific Expo into your search engine. We'll be holding a picket outside the Expo on the first day of the event, May 10th, and all are invited to our protest. Since the PM is fond of repeating things five times, I thought I would say the word we need to campaign five times. There are resources to help with the campaign and people in Australia working on these issues. There is an international campaign called the Global Days of Action Against Military Spending. It has a website, Demilitarize, with uh, the Z rather than S.org. If you look up that, you'll find a lot, lots of material. There are people you can call on. There's our picket you can go to. We need to object to the revolving door of politicians and ADF generals going into arms corporations. Okay. So, so there's, there's all this and more. Tomorrow, coinciding with Anzac Day, CIPRI will be announcing, CIPRI stands for the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, releases its figures for, for the year just ended. And I'm afraid to say that despite the pandemic and the absolute necessity for action on climate change, there will still be an increase in military spending around the world. Thanks everyone. Hello, <clears throat> Hello everyone. I think we still have Dennis there on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, here we go. Um, I'm Albert Palazzo, and I'm speaking to you today from um, the Gundungara um, land. And thank you to the organizers of this conference for asking me to speak here today. So I'm gonna be talking about an alternate defense philosophy for Australia. Um, a different way to think about our, our defense requirements and also our defense um, acquisitions and purchases. So I believe it's highly likely that later this year, Australia will commence another defense white paper review. I suspect that much will be said about China, the alliance with the United States, and weapons and policies needed to secure the future of Australia. If we are lucky, climate change will get an all too brief mention. Following tradition, the paper will argue for the expenditure of vast sums of money as well as extol the virtues of the dependence upon the United States. The white paper will have a look and feel of previous iterations and any differences will be around the margins. Alas, I fear the white paper will not admit to any need to change the fundamentals of Australia's security philosophy. That is a pity because in a changing world, it is essential to be open to new ideas, new options and new methods if Australia is to succeed under the different technological, climatic and geopolitical conditions that are coming and some of which have arrived. In this short paper, I will introduce a different philosophical foundation for Australia's future security. Instead of more of the same, I believe Australia should base its defense projections on the philosophy known as the strategic defensive. 
Now, when a state uh, considers its defense philosophy, there are not a lot of options um, you know, to choose from. And in fact, there's only three. You could be a st strategic offensive state. You can be a, you could practice the strategic defense, which is what I argue for, or you could simply demilitarize completely. None of these are new actually, and they're as old as war itself. Just to explain them briefly, uh, the strategic offense is a security setting preferred by strong powers that are intent on annexing territory or wishing to impose their will on others. The United States, Russia, and China are all strategic offensive states. The strategic defense is usually adopted by weak states who do not have territorial ambitions and who only want to maintain the status quo. Switzerland, Sweden, and Finland are strategically defensive states. And demilitarized states are those that accept that their survival depends on the goodwill of others. Costa Rica, Andorra, and a host of small island nations are examples of demilitarized states. Australia is an island continent which lacks natural enemies and resides in a part of the world that is distant from traditional points of tension. Theoretically, Australia should be a natural candidate for, such a, for the strategic defensive. However, the Australian people have always lived in fear of invasion, no matter how unjustified, and see themselves as geographic outsiders. Australia has also never identified with a particular military philosophy. Instead, it aligns with a great power protector. The Australian Defence Force is designed to enable itself to be embedded within its partner's way of war. This means Australia, a natural strategic defensive state, mirrors in miniature a strategic offensive state, in this case, the United States. The result is incoherence in our policies. Now, if Australia wanted to become a strategic defensive state, recent technological advances actually work in our favor. Technological leaps in long range precision strike missiles, sensor capabilities on land, sea, sub, subsurface, air and space, as well as drones and miniaturization, miniaturization all favor the defender. The result is that offensive operations against a defensive minded opponent have become harder and more expensive to wage. It is now possible for a, a defender to create defensive zones that measure in thousands of kilometers. That the defender enjoys a clear advantage in weaponry has happened before. The period from the US Civil War in 1861 to the end of the First World War in 1918 was dominated by the defender and the attacker was at a disadvantage. What is different now is the depth of the defensive zone as well as ability to locate targets with pervasive and ubiquitous sensors. Thus, the natural strength of Australia's geographic isolation has been reinforced by modern weaponry. An ADF organized around the idea of the strategic defensive would look different from what it does at the present. There will be three core elements. There will be somebody who, or something that fires a missile. And this could be land-based, on a truck-based mobile launcher. It could be from a ship or it could be from an aircraft. It doesn't really matter. There'll be a network of sensors consisting of air, sea, and land devices. And ultimately, a low earth orbit satellite network that could see the entire battle space and locate targets. And there'll be a command control center that would analyze data collected by sensors and assign targets to shooters. Other types of forces would still exist, the ones that we were much more familiar with, such as the infantry and submarines, but they would no longer be the forces of decision for an, for an ADF optimized on the strategic defensive. Now, I have to say the, uh, there's a few qualifications here, and I wish to make it clear that I'm not advocating for a weaker or even non-existent defense force. I believe a nation's peace is best provided for by its military. What I want is a stronger, and what I really want is a more rational defense force. 
the adoption of the strategic defensive will not necessarily lead to a peace dividend, I'm afraid. It's not meant to be saving money saving design. It's a reallocation of money to provide a defense force that is actually more suited for Australia's interests and for Australia's place in the world. It should also be clear that by the strategic defense, I do not mean neutrality. I do not expect the propensity for humans to resolve their grievances by violence to disappear anytime soon, despite our desires for peace. Nor do I demand an end to the alliance with the United States. Australia entered into the alliance willingly and with its eyes open. In fact, Australia actually chased the United States. However, I do believe that the alliance needs to be rediscussed. It's time for a redefinition of roles and responsibilities. Additionally, the strategic defense does not mean that the Australian Defense Force will not need to the ability to inflict pain on an attacker. Being on the defense does not equate with being passive. Australian forces must still have the ability to maneuver an attack. What the defensive means is that Australia, when it does attack, does so from the perspective of protecting its interests, not imposing our interests on others. Lastly, I feel obligated to state quite clearly that nuclear weapons have no place in the philosophy of the strategic defensive. The adoption of these weapons would require Australia to have a willingness to risk es escalation across the nuclear threshold and thereby commit suicide. And suicide, one has to recognize as a silly defense policy. So why should we do this? Why should we adopt the strategic defensive? Why should we turn away from what we've been doing so far? Well, I think right now, Australia relies on its great power partner for protection. And, it means that, and that means Australia has rarely been able to articulate a defense strategy of its own. It's usually been co-opted into the partner's goals. For example, Australia's lengthy presence in the Middle East wars, a, a theater of war very distant from our shores. As a strategic defensive state, Australia will be able to forge a national strategy that focuses on Australian interests and protect Australian um, rights and needs. <laughs> For example, placing the priority on our engagement with regional nations. The strategic defense would also allow a more coherent defense philosophy. It will allow us to foster a whole of government resort response to regional concerns. And the nation's security posture would not need to accommodate the needs of a strategic offensive partner as it presently the case. It would also allow us to respond to different um, threats. At the moment, the, the main threat is perceived as being China. And that is in part because the United States sees China as the primary threat. However, and as some of the other speakers have said today, climate change presents a much graver risk to national survival than China. A security philosophy based on the strategic defensive would allow multiple threads in security planning. Australia could choose to prepare for a major war, but also for conflicts that might come out of climate change. The strategic defense would also be a more honest policy for Australia. Frankly, Australia compared to other countries, more powerful country is relatively weak. And right now we act above our level because of the alliance. And this has benefits, but it also brings problems. The Australian Defence Force not only tries uh, and, and tries really hard to achieve interoperability with the US forces to be able to be a part of the US military, but it also acquires um, weapons like the submarines that Dennis spoke about that are designed to fit within the American way of war, right? A state that focuses on the strategic defensive, Australia might decide that it still requires submarines or frigates, but these would be much smaller ones, much cheaper ones, suitable to our needs and strength. And also there's an element of logic that's missing in our current um, strategic policy. Australia is a natural strategic defensive state, both by our size and also by our location. 
So I ask, why not actually become one? So to conclude, the strategic defense of Office Australia, the best option it has for survival in what is expected to be an increasingly dangerous world. It is not a call to embrace passivity or neutrality, nor to seek opportunities uh, for violence and aggression, but rather to acquire awareness and strength and prioritization of our own interests. I am one with Vegetitis, that late fourth century Roman military theorist whose words remain relevant for today. He who desires peace, let him prepare for war. And for me, the strategic defensive is the most best way to make that preparation. Thank you for your time. Good, thank you. Thank you to all four presenters and we're sticking pretty well within time. Um, now, Nick has been noting all of the comments coming through and uh, before we invite questions from the floor, Nick, are there any questions that you'd like to extract from the chat uh, at the bottom of our screens that you think could be directed to people to prompt a bit of discussion? So over to you, Nick, are there some questions? You're on mute, Nick. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, now, um, Jake talked about denialism, and there's a question here asking, does denialism not also extend to the Anzac myths? Don't we deny Australia's actual war raging, war waging tradition and its reluctance to proactively seek peace? So that's one question aimed at Jake. Um, question directed towards Cheryl. I was wondering how, it's not me, this is from someone else. I was wondering how our future government could make the policy changes needed to shift to these alternative security formulations. And this is the nub of the question. Do you think that feminist foreign policy would be a good place to start? Um, Both Dennis and Cheryl have mentioned fear. Does fear play a significant role in formulating Australia's security policy? And another question. There seems to be no limit and no parliamentary discussion about the vast number of billions that need to be spent on new offensive weaponry. There's bipartisan support. The military budget cannot be questioned. What drives this? Fear, compliant media, capture of the politicians and army brass by the arms industry? Uh, another one, in what way could the ADF respond to increased climate change? In what way could the ADF respond to increase climate change security? And is the ADF the right body to do that? With regard to greenhouse gas emissions, what proportion is sourced from military activities? To what extent can this be utilized in arguments regarding climate change? And one final question, um, is it possible for us Australians to defend ourselves without depending on a big power such as the USA? So there's a whole, a whole range of questions there. Yep. Well, can we, what we'll do, perhaps um, uh, just run through them as we did with the speakers. So, Jake, you're being asked about denialism in the context of the Anzac myth. Cheryl, how will governments change their policy? And for Cheryl and Dennis, the whole issue of fear. And then uh, Albert, um, the whole question of uh, Australia being able to defend itself. So um, can we start off with Jake? running through them? Yes, okay. Um, I mean, it, it is uh, a tricky one um, to imagine how Australia might uh, maintain its alliance with the United States uh, and avoid being expected to join in um, offensive military operations. The, uh, 
National Security Strategy of 2002, published under the administration of George W. Bush, um, contains the phrase um, uh, that uh, uh, democracies have um, important responsibilities as well as important rights. Uh, so, in other words, um, a country such as Australia is expected to join in um, an operation such as the invasion of Iraq in 2003, for example, which was an act of aggression. And um, all the um, uh, contrived and manufactured verbiage about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction was a deceitful campaign to cloak that act of aggression in an entirely misleading guise. Um, I want to um, address the question of um, arms industries as well. It's interesting how often uh, now we see um, the interests of the um, arms industry cropping up in the guise of uh, a plan for jobs, a plan for employment. So, for example, um, uh, my, um, my own vote in the forthcoming federal election will, will be in the division of Gilmore. Um, which is held on a very narrow margin by Labour. It was the only seat that Labour won from the coalition at the last election. And a portion of the constituency is served by a newspaper called the Illawarra Mercury. So it ran a feature in a recent edition um, with uh, a chap called David Bridge, who chairs the Illawarra Innovative Industry Network. And he was very keen to emphasise that, as he put it, Defence is really an untapped opportunity for the Illawarra because there's a tremendous amount of money to be spent with new equipment, systems, plants and resourcing. And in uh, an area such as the Illawarra, um, that might be very appealing because, of course, um, it has a rich industrial heritage being dominated by uh, Wollongong and Port Kembla. Uh, and uh, since the um, retreat from steel exporting, for example, there's a a portion of um, industrial activity that has gone uh, from the area. So um, a lot of people will be very attentive to any source of opportunities for the kind of um, uh, high tech um, engineering employment, which adds value and therefore commands a good salary and good prospects. Uh, and defence as an industry has been identified by various layers of Australian government to step up and fill that gap. And again, that's another appeal which I think can only really be countered by putting forward an alternative. There's no point saying to people, no, no, we mustn't have these defence jobs, you can't have them, let's stop them, uh, without then putting forward an alternative. So, for example, this is uh, one of the appealing things about the um, campaign by this group Rewiring Australia, uh, which emphasises how... Um, uh, getting Australia to uh, switch the emphasis of its power sourcing to um, solar panels owned at um, household and community level would entail a major programme of employment and training for tradies. Uh, so tradies are, are fairly close to the archetypical Scott Morrison swing voters. Um, so uh, to, to win over tradies and people who would be interested in those kinds of, of good employment opportunities as part of a, a comprehensive decarbonisation plan is a good candidate to be put forward to reduce the relative appeal of defence industries as a source of high-tech jobs by offering people hope of something different and something better. So that's how that would fit into the, to the theme I put forward at the outset. Um, if you want to be progressive, you can't just say no, you've got to say what a better alternative would look like. Mm, very good. Cheryl, please. First, I'd like to thank James for his excellent uh, questions. And for me, I think part of the problem we have now is all of our elements and departments of state are siloed and our security problems are not siloed. So the, the best way I think a future government could enable a policy shift to a different defence strategy is to ask the right question. If you ask the question, how do we defeat adversary X? The answer is always going to be missiles and submarines or, or some uh, such combination thereof. But if we ask the question, how does government secure the uh, lives of Australians? Then the answer must include things like health, economic policy, environmental policy, infrastructure, it must deal with how we respond to climate change in terms of moving cities, 
It must deal with how we maintain food and water and energy security. So it's a much bigger group of options uh, are then considered by government. At the moment, government considers a small set of options for defence, provided by defence, from defence, for defence. And the old adage is true, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Albert's given us a slightly different perspective, but even then you need to ask the right question to, to get to that answer. Uh, the second part of the question is, do we need a feminist foreign policy? And I think it's, it's less about, do we need a feminist po foreign policy, but do we need a balanced for foreign policy that reflects all voices? And certainly we, we don't have enough women's voices in security dialogue, which is also why expanding into to health and agriculture brings those voices in. Um, and the other thing we don't have is First Nation voices in our foreign policy. We don't have disadvantaged voices in our foreign policy. And I think um, it, it's really about addressing the balance rather than feminist per se, although there's some good evidence now that uh, women peacekeepers achieve more successful peace. So those voices need to be there. It's about balance in our foreign policy and in the voices represented in it. And it's also about connection. At the moment, there's a lot of disconnection, both in our, our security and foreign policy. And so a broader church needs to be formed, which includes groups such as Raising Peace. Not, And we had, a, I think, an excellent a presentation from Dennis that just said how these groups are not only ignored but marginalised and punished for, for speaking out. And we need not to punish these groups for speaking out and bringing different perspectives. And I'm really encouraged by some of the community groups all around Australia. And for those that haven't heard of it, coming up this Thursday is day two of the Women's Climate Congress, which is voices of women rising on the issue of climate change. And it also accepts non-binary as well, so it's not exclusively feminist. So that might be something that uh, some of the audience might also like to join. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So Dennis, over to you, please. Um, in, in, in relation to the, the first issue about ANZAC, uh, I, I do think there is, um, there is space in Australia, or there should be space in Australia for um, for a, a critical assessment of that particular campaign. And um, while at the same time, recognizing the bravery of the individual soldiers and officers involved, but that um, um, a large segment of the society, of, of society must recognize that World War I was one of the most dreadful wars and most unnecessary wars that we've ever had. And, and, and had the, it was a record precursor for World War II. <clears throat> um, I, I, I just forgot the second question, but on, on the issue of a feminist uh, foreign policy, I, I think that, um, I, I don't think I'm the right person to, um, to push that, although I think there is, there is a, a vast amount of space and room for more, uh, for more women involved in this, uh, because the men have certainly mucked it up. Um, in relation to fear, um, it's been a factor in Australian history. The, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but prior to World War I, and this is, this is in our history books, it's not, it's not just Dennis speaking, you know, the British um, deliberately um, encouraged the Australian government to buy weaponry, to buy submarines and to buy battleships. Um, and they based that around the fear of Japan because Japan in 1904 uh, defeated the Russians in a, in a, in a, a sea battle uh, off Vladivostok. And that this is the beginning of this. This is a, um, this is a campaign that works and that Australia uh, Australians can can fear and uh, can easily be frightened. And um, um, what Peter Dutton does in a negative way, somewhat brilliantly, is that he puts he puts a uh, a, a scenario, especially about China, where he'll say that China is rearming, 
and he'll he'll quote figures, but he 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 doesn't he he only quotes one part of the story. For example, in the in the South Sea, um, South China Sea, there are China has created some islands using a bit of sand and a bit of some other things, and and, and um, I, I don't know how many islands, but let's say it's five. Uh, just cheek the jowl. Um, next uh, in South Korea, there's 60 U.S. bases. The U.S. has built a new base at Jeju Island um, for the use of the United States. Japan has built an, an extra base on its territory. Japan has got three new bases it's building in Okinawa, uh, and it has 150 U.S. bases. Guam has been reorganized. Uh, Australia has has re reconcreted Tyndall Air Base, so that um, so I mean the, you know the balance the balance that you know that the he just I means he just gets one piece of the information and and exaggerates it out of all proportion, and so we've got this sort of scenario where we are fearful of the Chinese, and then there's un unintended consequences where poor people with Chinese look about them, uh, uh, suffer from a certain amount of racism now. Um, I, I believe it's worse in America than it is here, but still uh, there is a little bit of it here. So it's a very effective way to, to, uh, to get people to, to spend more and to uh, ignore the real needs that we have. Thank you. Good. Albert, please. Can Australia defend itself? Um, well, yes, I believe it can, uh, but it's require, going to require the organization, both the political class and also the military class and the defense commentariat class to take a different approach than we currently do. Now, at the present, the Australian Defense Force does not exist uh, to defend Australia. It's not designed to defend Australia. It's designed to go off with the United States in a conflict, um, and it's, um, it's the United States that theoretically then defends Australia, whether that's in def the defense of Australia in Iraq or in Afghanistan or someplace else. Um, the Australian Defense Force does not currently design to defend Australia. Um, the, the Royal Australian Air Force could easily change the flags on their aircraft to the American flag because they are exactly like an American uh, wing, uh, an Air Force wing. And in case of a future conflict, a great war conflict, they would fly off to wherever the Americans decided they were needed. They can't actually defend Australia because we only create certain bits, um, certain parts of a defense system and the United States provides the other parts, those essential parts, like the sensors and the communications. So our Australian Air Force, if it needed to defend Australian airspace, is not going to really be able to do that without American assistance. And it's the same way where the, um, the Navy is going too. And if we were to buy or eventually acquire these new vessels, these new submarines, uh, or these new frigates with the American um, have weaponry systems on board, you know, ultimately their, the ability to use those systems is up to the United States because you know, they control the software and the upgrades and all those other essential little bits. So what I'm you know, trying to argue for is to actually define, design a defense force that is designed to defend Australia. And then once we have that down, whatever else we want to do, um, that's an extra. And it is possible, I, I believe, to defend Australia with the resources Australia has. It just requires a different looking defense force with a different emphasis on how it's going to be used. Right? And, and that's the key. But the technology that's now available is very much in our favor to do that. Uh, to create a defensive system um, across Australia um, that would make a potential attacker 
And I'm not saying that I, I have fear of invasion because I, I don't. Uh, but if somebody wanted to exert pressure on Australia, we would be able to manage that threat or make it certainly too expensive for this potential <laughs> adversary uh, to go ahead and attempt to apply pressure. They would think twice about it. So yes, I think we can do this. And as, as Cheryl has said, we, we need to include this within a much broader definition of what security is, you know, including, including you know, um, um, you know, you know not, not just climate change, but also health. Um, and and you know, right now, you know, by giving the Department of Defense so much authority within the government, um, it you know, has a singular focus. Um, and yes, that's saying about, you know, you know, if you got a you know, hammer, everything's a nail. Well, it's very true. Yeah. Um, and yeah. most of the you know, people who I used to work with, you know, going off and uh, joining, you know, being you know, into an American unit or serving overseas with the American forces, this was the highlight of their career. Yeah. It wasn't serving with Australian forces yeah. uh, because, you know, that's where the big game is. So, yes, we can do it, but we'd have to rethink and reprioritize in ways that, you know, the Australian people might understand, but certainly the Australian government and the military leadership do not currently understand. Right. Thanks so much indeed, Albert. So we've had a few questions. Um, we're now going to go into breakout groups. And so Jasmine and Mansi will just break you all up. We've got a a good enrollment for today, which is great. Thank you. We welcome you all back uh, to the uh, final part of this afternoon. The music that we've been hearing in enhancing our deliberations is by Margaret Walters. Uh, her old uh, website is called margaretwalters.com. It's got a lot of information on that website. You can also Google her to find out about the rest of the music that she produces. So what we'll now do for the remaining minutes of the session will be to invite um, the rapporteurs of the four groups just to give a quick review of what their discussions have covered. We're going through all this at high speed, I realize, but we're able to cover quite a lot of material in today's session. So let's start off Jake, uh, either Jake or the rapporteur in Jake's session. That's me. Uh, and we talked about fear a lot. And Carrie Little had a very good definition of fear, and I couldn't write it down quick enough. False evidence, and then the A and the R. Appearing real. Appearing real. Uh, so we talked about that. We talked about ways of managing fear and how to overcome fear. And it was very much that uh, the opposite of fear is love and joy and what we can do in our own circles to create, um, yeah, to lessen fear. Um, so that was one of our main thing. Then we talked about media and uh, an alternative media. And uh, Jake talked about uh, not-for-profit media in the UK and the US that have been, that are much stronger and that doesn't um, exist in Australia yet. I mean, that the pearls and irritations but to actually have a media outlet uh, that is not for profit because in the end commercial interest will prevail over any, uh, any uh, journalism or any investigations. Yeah. So that was yeah, our uh, contribution. Good. Thank you very much, Wies. Um, we go now to uh, Cheryl or your rapporteur. Well, Keith, I forgot to appoint a rapporteur, so <laughs> unless someone puts their hand up very quickly, it will have to be me. So I think we, we really sat and shared in our group and uh, we contributed our, our own initiatives and, and, and shared that with each other. So I think it was the theme was really about connection and listening to all voices and particularly our First Nation voices, but also about action and the importance of moving from talking to doing. And that, that was really it. It's, it's about connecting 
talking and doing. And if I've, I've missed some critical point, uh, please, anyone in my group, put up their hand and, and, and add something to the conversation. Hans is having a quick look around, but no one's wanting to contradict what you've said. And it's just so important that we network and maintain social capital. Great. Well, look, thanks, Cheryl. Can we go to Dennis, either to Dennis or your rapporteur, Dennis? Um, I couldn't be Peter Dutton enough and, and bully somebody into being the, <laughs> the uh, rapporteur. So I, 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 anyway, I'm doing it myself. So um, um, the discussion opened with um, uh, a congratulatory remarks about Albert's approach. But uh, it was felt that there wasn't enough emphasis on, on, on diplomacy and peace building uh, among our neighbours and near neighbour and, and far neighbours. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, there should be more emphasis on creating positive relations with our uh, uh, Pacific neighbours, as well as um, people in the region. And, um, and to um, negate the fear factor. Um, there, there was, um, again, some more discussion about uh, the positive and um, the issue of the Solomon Islands was brought up. And um, the speaker felt that there, that Australia didn't emphasize this positive uh, contribution that it makes, and it should be making a more positive contribution to the Pacific region rather than being mean, mean spirited and uh, measly uh, handed with its resources. And that led on to the discussion about how it's um, ignored the Pacific's um, island nations, please about environmental on environmental issues and this has created some bad will between ourselves and our small island nations um, we had a burning question was that what were, what were we supposed to do if the president of the ukraine uh, under attack from a, a large neighbor asked for bushmasters surely that was the right thing to do and um, that was uh, quite a, a challenging question but the consensus of the answer seemed to be that the, the, the need at the moment is for a ceasefire and, um, and, and, uh, recon and not reconciliation, but um, a negotiation and to send weapons was uh, equivalent to uh, sending, um, uh, you know, just throwing petrol on, on the fire. Um, we were, Someone brought up the fact that the latest budget has 48, 49 billion put aside for military spending over this year, uh, this coming year, and yet there are so many needs. Um, and someone brought up the fact that um, the AMA president uh, recently asked for 20 billion to be spent on hospitals to bring them up to scratch after the uh, emergency with the pandemic. So that there was, um, so all in all, the uh, people wrestled with those those issues, um, and um, it was quite a successful discussion. Mm. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Dennis and Albert. Either you or your rapporteur, please, to report. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you, Keith. As I was taking some notes, um, uh, there were uh, a few um, themes across the the groups. Um, and uh, one of the ones that we looked at was uh, you know, fear and Australia's uh, sense of fear going back to really the nation's founding and really sort of being unjustified in, in today's age. But uh, that fear of abandonment you know, almost being hardwired into the uh, psyche of uh, Australians, even if it can't be understand, uh, understood. Um, and also that our foreign affairs and our, you know, the need for a primacy of engagement across the region, um, but that not happening uh, with the uh, regional engagement being under-resourced by comparison to uh, the military being the way that military is resourced. And, and also, um, uh, you know, I believe it was Ray, uh, you know, made the point that uh, all of the speakers, um, you know, had a 
constant theme, or, you know, which was climate change. And, um, uh, you, know, you know, and yet it's so difficult to get anything done in the area because uh, there is no real international forum other than um, uh, the annual COPS, which, uh, you know, um, Australia sort of undercuts uh, the outcomes. Um, and so a sense of really what can we do? And, uh, you know, it, it's not so much, you know, going forward or a fear of abandonment, but, you know, a fear of frustration of uh, being able to um, manage these, you know, pressing problems uh, going forward. Good. Excellent. Thanks so much indeed, Albert. Well, it's, it just remains for me to do a few thank yous and then I will throw to Nick for any closing remarks or announcements. So I'd like to thank on your behalf the four presenters who gave us that in very concentrated format, uh, so much material to think about. I'd also like to thank uh, our musician, the folk singer, Margaret Walters. And you, you're also welcome to contact Margaret about her music, margaretwalters2 at gmail.com. margaretwalters2 at gmail.com. She's authorized us to send out her email address. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Jasmine and Mansi. Um, increasingly in this Zoom dominated era, you always need to have good IT people and Mansi and Jasmine have been fantastic at everything that's gone so well. So congratulations to Jasmine and Mansi. And also to thank you to Nick Dean for um, convening this session in part of this three day peace festival, which is running at the moment. Um, so my final comment, keep up the work and there is no long service leave in the peace movement. So.